Okay, so we have wrapped up John chapter one, and today we're gonna get to start John chapter two. So I should hear like, yay, and excited noises, because that's, that's awesome. Um, we've been, not, not that we're sad to see, see John chapter one go, but that we're, um, you know, we're excited to, we're, we're now getting into um, the signs, the seven or eight signs that John the evangelist includes in his gospel so that we might believe that Jesus is the son of God. That's good. We're going to talk about traditions today. So there's a tradition. I'll write my name at the top and we're in John chapter two. And we've got 12 verses to read. We're going to start by reading John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And then after we read, um, we're just going to dive in. So um, let's see here. Matt, will you read for us verses 1 through 5? Claudia, you're next on my screen. If you can read 6 through 8. Katie, if you'll read for me chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, and then Alyssa, if you get just one verse, you read verse 12. But there's going to be more for us to read, so don't worry. All right, Matt, you go ahead first. Okay, chapter 2, 1 through 5. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding about 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to his servants, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some of it out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. I'm so embarrassed. So I was scrambling and I can't find the page. Is it all right? John uh, Katie, we're on, we're on 887. If you, <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. Down there at the bottom, John chapter two, verses nine through 11. Thank you so much. Okay, here we go. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridge groom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. Good. Thank you. Now, uh, now we're starting to get, especially as we continue through the Gospel of John, into a lot of Hebrew and Greek words and names. And I don't know about you, but these are not native languages for me. They probably aren't for you. So however you pronounce them, just you just push right on through it. We're, we're not going to worry about pronunciations too much. Um, so uh, that's just disclaimer. All right, so here in chapter two, verse one, it says, on the third day. Now, we've been going through day by day, beginning in John chapter one, of the events and uh, situations that led up to John the Evangelist personally meeting Christ. And at the end of John chapter one, let's see, we had the testimony of John, that was one day. And then we had the next day on verse 29, and the next day on 35, and the next day on verse 43. And so we've got four days in John chapter 1, and then this says on the third day. This is most likely three days after that fourth day. So we've now completed out the first week of this narrative. This is just a timeline reference. I had a, a question that came up when I taught this on Wednesday, of just, when this is on the third day, is this a reference to the three days Christ spent in the tomb? Sort of like how um, he says, I'll give you the sign of the prophet Jonah when he spent three days and, and nights in the belly of the whale, or destroy this temple and I'll raise it in three days. We're going to see that one next week when we, when we talk about cleansing of the temple. Those are obvious references to his death and resurrection three days later, this is more just a timeline thing. So I just wanted to sort of clarify that. 
This is on the third day. There was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. So I've sort of drawn here where I'd rather have my map. So let's draw our map. Where did we end up at the end of John chapter 1? What city were we in? Who remembers? Bethsaida. Bethsaida is the city that Andrew and Philip and, P and Peter were from. And Bethsaida is up here on the top of the Sea of Galilee. Bethsaida. But that's not where we were in John chapter 1. We were in Bethany. If you look at verse 28, this, these things happened at Bethany on the Jordan River. So this is the Sea of Galilee. We've got the Jordan River, which is the squiggle right here. And at the end of John chapter 1, we're still in Bethany because in verse 43, it just says that Jesus decided to go to Galilee. So here's Galilee over here. And it's a region. Bethany's in a different region. And it says he decided to go to Galilee. There's some important cities in Galilee. Cana is one of them. Nazareth is another. Nazareth is where Jesus lived. Uh, he was born in Bethlehem, but he grew up in Nazareth. Cana is the city that Nathaniel, one of his disciples, is from. And that's where they're headed. They, in 43, it says he decides to go to Galilee. Sometime between there, or it may have been the reason, excuse me, that he decided to go to Galilee, it says there's now a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, who's the mother of Jesus? Mary. Mary. It's a good Sunday school question. There we go. Nice and simple. So the mother of Jesus was there. In verse 2, Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. Now, I don't know about y'all, but when I got married, we did some significant planning for our wedding. And when we sent out invitations, they didn't say, bring you and five of your closest friends. Like, that, that's not what our invitation said. So, like, at the end of John chapter 1, how many disciples have we collected so far? How many disciples have now come to meet and spend time with Jesus? Can we name them all? What are their names? Um, Andrew and John. Andrew and John. Andrew and probably John, because it doesn't, it doesn't say his name, but we're going to write John. Um, Simon, Philip, and Nathaniel. Good. Simon, also called Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel. Nathaniel, if you're in some of the other Gospels, some of the Synoptic Gospels, he's also called Bartholomew. So if you're ever looking at um, like a list of disciple names and you go, where's Nathaniel? He's also called Bartholomew. So we've got five of these guys. Jesus is also invited. And so what's likely that's happened here, Mary's already there at the wedding. And Jesus shows up with his five disciples and they go, hey, that's fine. Bring them too. We kind of get the impression this is a family wedding, that Jesus was somebody who would, it's okay for him to bring extra people. But it's unlikely that they knew he would be bringing five guys with him from Bethany when he came. And so now that he's arrived at the wedding, there's a problem that comes up. And what's the problem? Running out of wine. The wine has run out. Uh-oh. So there's something we need to know about Jewish weddings at the time. They were not short affairs. Right. They were long. We're, we're talking about seven days long. My wedding was not seven days, but seven days long. And we also need to know that the bridegroom, or just the groom, is how we normally call him in our day, he was responsible for hosting the wedding celebration. He paid for it. He organized it. It was his family who got it together. Um, the servants would have all reported to him. And it's probable that he's the one that they're related to. And now that the wine has run out, but the wedding has not run out, they're in sort of a socially embarrassing situation. This is an embarrassment for the bridegroom and his family. It, in, in those days, because it was such a big deal, the embarrassedness, that's not a real word, the embarrassedness of the situation could lead to legal consequences. Like you could be sued for this, for, for doing this wrong. So Mary 
Mary makes a complaint. What does she turn to Jesus and say? They have no wine. They have no wine. Now notice the simplicity of her statement. She doesn't say, uh, hey, Jesus, get up and do a miracle. She doesn't say, hey, Jesus, you need to go buy more wine. She just turns to Jesus and makes a statement. They have no wine. And, and there's some things we need to remember. His relationship to her is kind of special. He's not just her firstborn. He's a divinely promised son. He's the son of promise. Um, that his father was not Joseph, who, by the way, Joseph's not mentioned in this account or throughout the rest of the Gospel of John. It's probable that he's actually passed away by now. So this is just Mary here. Jesus is there, and she turns to him and says, they have no wine. And so it's not unlikely for us to think that she was just making a statement. Now, she may have expected him to do something about it. It's possible that throughout his life, whenever there was a problem that needed solving, Jesus probably knew the right thing to do. Now, that doesn't mean that he's been going throughout his life performing miracles. In verse 11, it says this, the first of his signs. He's actually never done a miracle before that anybody's witnessed. This is the very first one. So when she says they have no wine, Mary is not expecting him to do something spectacular and miraculous. But she is sort of hinting. I, you know, raise your hand if your, your mom's ever dropped hints. You need to be doing something about this. Okay? So, Scott, I wanted you to interject something if I could here. Sure. This is the same woman who, throughout the Lord's life, was somewhat subconsciously and consciously recording that there is something very different about this boy and very special. I mean, from, from her immaculate conception, mm -hmm. see this child as a virgin, the, you know, the, the wise men show up with these gifts and she's like, oh my goodness, where'd they come from? Um, Jesus teaching in the temple at a young age and he had so much knowledge and wisdom. It's like, the Bible refers to Mary as she pondered these things. And mm -hmm. so have a lifetime Jesus is a man by now, and we have a woman with a lifetime of understanding that this, I, this man is God. You know, this is a divine interact. I don't even know how to put it, but something no, very special about him. That's exactly and, right. Um, and so asking the, just telling him, I, I love the fact that she just simply states the problem and doesn't ask anything. She just says. Yeah. I think she's expecting him to do something. Yeah. She may not be expecting a miracle, though a miracle is what happens. But I she's expecting she him to do something. And she's sort of prodding him. And his response here um, is interesting. Because his response is something that I would never say to my own mother. Okay? What does he respond to Mary with when she makes this statement? What's the very first word out of his mouth? Woman. 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 What does that have to do with me? Um, <laughs> I don't know about you, but if I addressed my mother this way, I'd be in big trouble. Because that's not how we talk. This word woman here in the Greek however, is not a disrespectful term for you to use with your mother. This word is gunai, which I'm, I, I think if I was going to write it, would look something like, there, that's an N, and looks like that, gunai. It, it's a term of respect. It's a term of compassion. Today, if I spoke that way to my mom, it would be disrespectful. But in that time and day, that was a respectful way to address a woman. And I, so that you don't have to take my word for it, let's go read another place where Jesus uses the same word, and we can see that that's the case. Flip with me to John chapter 19. In John chapter 19, Jesus is on the cross. 
Jesus has been crucified, but he is not dead yet. We're in John chapter 19. I'll write it up here in the corner. Where'd it go? John chapter 19, and in verse um, 25. Um, oh, we lost Katie. Where did she go? Which one of you did not get to read? She had a meeting. She had a meeting. Okay, that's all right. We'll let her catch up with the recording. Lauren, did you get to read earlier? Okay, yeah. that means it's your turn. Read for me verses 25 through 27 of John chapter 19. Okay. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to his disciple, to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that, that and from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. Good. So here Jesus is hanging on the cross. He looks down and he sees three Marys. His mother Mary, his mother's sister, apparently also called Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. That had to have been really confusing, by the way. That's just occurred to me to have two Marys in the same family. Um, maybe it meant sister-in-law. I don't know. But three Marys and the disciple whom Jesus loved. Which one is that? Do y'all remember? John. 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 This is John's favorite way to refer to himself, by his relationship to Christ. And he looks down and he says to his mother, woman, behold your son. And he uses this exact same word that's translated woman in John chapter 2. Now, this is a situation where we can see that Jesus has not just been followed by his mother as he goes through his ministry. Remember, Jesus is uh, the fulfillment of the law. One of the things that he did in his earthly ministry was to obey and fulfill all of the Jewish law given by Moses and attain that righteousness that comes by works that we are not able to do. So the fifth commandment, honor thy father, thy father and mother, he would have taken very seriously. She's been not just following him along, but under his care. And now he's hanging on the cross, he's dying, and he's no longer able to do that. So one of his very last acts on this earth is to make sure that she's going to continue to be cared for. This is a compassionate, loving situation, and he uses this same word. So we see this as a term of endearment. Now, why am I making a big deal about this? There are some English translations that in John chapter 2 will not use the word woman. They will change it. They'll make it say man, or they'll make it say something else, or they'll leave it out entirely because they don't want to write it in a way that would sound offensive, that would make Jesus sound like he was being rude. But it's better for us to understand what things meant in the Greek rather than to take what we think to be true and impose that on the text. So here, if we're flip with me back to John chapter 1, if we'll remember from last week, he, John has been so careful to transcribe the exact words that were said, even if his audience may not have known the original language. So in John chapter 1, verse 38, he says, Rabbi, and then in parentheses, which means teacher. In verse uh, 41, he says, Messiah in Hebrew, which means Christ in the Greek. And so he would have been careful to use that word, and it's appropriate for us to leave the word as he wrote it, just, just to say woman, and to understand that that was a term of compassion. And he says, what does this have to do with me? This is not a, a shirking or rejecting of responsibility. This is a situation where he's not in charge of the wedding. There are other people whose job is to be responsible for the amount of wine that's available at the wedding. And so when he's saying this, it's not to, to be rude and say, I don't really care about this problem. It's just to say, hey, mom, remember, we're guests here. We're not in charge here. Even if it's a family wedding, we've been invited. It's not our job to solve the problem. And then back in John chapter 2, he follows up that sentence with, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. What is this reference, my hour? What is he referring to? The hour that he's revealed to man as, as God, as, as divinity, as a miracle worker, 
his he's saying that my ministry is not yet starting good so the start of his ministry good other other thoughts Sometimes when he uses my hour, it refers to his death on the cross, that that was the fulfillment of his, mess, his, his mission of salvation here, um, his, his redemptive effort. Commentators disagree on that, but what they, what they all disagree on is that what he's referring to is a divine timeline, that, that the, the plan of his earthly ministry has been set out by somebody who is not a man or a woman, but God that this timeline belongs to God, and mom, no matter how good her intentions are, cannot push that timeline forward or, or hold it back. And there's many things in our lives that we don't like to wait on God's timeline, or we think he's moving too quickly. You know, sometimes, for example, in my life, when Tracy and I were trying to have children, that took much longer than we expected. We're planners. We had it all lined out. This is where we're going to have kids. God's timeline that is the only one that matters. Ours does not. Sometimes he wants us to do things sooner that we'd rather hold off because we're scared. We don't feel prepared. In, in either one of those situations, he's sort of chiding her here, gently saying, remember, mom, we're not in control here. God's in control. It's up to the father. This timeline has been set. Now she accepts this in verse five. It, she does not rebut him or anything. Instead, she only turns to the servants, having at least understood from him that he's, he's still going to do something about it. But remember, Mom, we're on God's timetable. He's still going to do something about it. So she says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now, at this point, we still don't have an indication that she's expecting something miraculous. She could have just expected him to go buy some more wine, and it's going to take some extra hands to carry it. Right? So... But he doesn't do that. He tell what does he tell the servants to do? He says, "Fill the jars with water." Fill the jars with water. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna erase our map here. These jars have been sort of sitting over to the side up until now in the story, and we haven't known about them. These there were how many jars? Um, six. six. Six jars. And what were they used for? For Jewish ceremonial washing. Good. Uh, some translations will say Jewish rites of purification. Um, I want us to know like where this comes from. So turn with me, keep a finger in John chapter two. Turn with me to Mark. This is our first time we've referenced Mark in this Bible study. Mark chapter seven. We're gonna get a hint as to what these were used for. Give me a nod when you get to Mark chapter 7. All right. In Mark chapter 7 and verse 1, it says, Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. And then in parentheses, For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And here it's listed as a tradition. This is not specified by Jewish law. There were washings specified by Jewish law with respect to sacrifices, but not when you would eat and those kinds of things. But this was a common tradition of the elders. And so here in this house, here for this wedding uh, celebration, there are six stone water jars that held between 20 or 30 gallons a piece, which means we've got about 120 to 180 gallons total of capacity here. And he says, fill them to the brim, which means that whether they had some in them or not, he doesn't say put anything else in them but water. Just fill them to the brim with water. Now, this was likely still clean water in that when they say wash their hands, it's not as though they all went and stuck their hands in it. You know, I mean, you and I could probably tell that would look dirty after a while, not clean. This was a celebration that had many servants. When you arrived and it was time for you to wash your hands, the servants would draw some of the water out and pour it over your hands for you to wash them and sort of shake them like this 
and, and now you're clean. So the water has just been drawn out this whole time. He says, fill it up to the brim. There's nothing else in these pots except for water. So back in John chapter 2, after he says, fill the jars with water, they filled them to the brim, and he says to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. Now, what other steps have gone on here? Has, has, have they had to add anything to it? Has he said anything over the stone jars? Has he waved his hands over them or anything mystical? He just said, fill them up, draw some out, take it to the master of the feast. Now, this word master of the feast literally means master of three tables. This is a little historical uh, note here. Master of three tables. Traditionally, they would not sit at a table like I'm sitting at this desk. They would recline by a table on a dining couch. And so, like, let's say they had, you know, a table here. They would start to put them together, three tables, and they would be seated around it like this on dining couches. And there'd be a man in the middle who would be the master of three tables. He's the servant assigned to that group. And over time, that word master of three tables became synonymous with the master of the feast. He was the head of the servants. He was sort of like the head butler on Downton Abbey. If you've ever, you know, don't raise your hand if you're too ashamed to say you watch Downton Abbey, but I, we like Downton Abbey. But so he's like the head butler and it's his job to taste the food before it goes out so we don't serve anything gross, to taste the wine to make sure it's good. And so they, they did what Jesus said. They draw some out and they take it to the master of the feast. What does the master of the feast do after having tasted the water now become wine? Tells the bridegroom he's been holding back the good stuff. You've been holding back on me. Now, yeah, does he say anything to the servants? No. Uh-uh. Does he, do, do the servants tell him where the wine came from? No. no. So he's not privy to the miracle. All he is, is a confirmation of the miracle. Because he has an immediate knee-jerk reaction. He's got the wine in his hand. There's, there's wine in his hand. And he goes over to see the bridegroom. This is the bridegroom. And he starts yelling at him, probably privately, not to be disrespectful. This is a servant to the bridegroom. But, but he says, look, my job is to run this party in a way that brings honor to you and your family. And, and this is not how we do things. Normally, we bring out the good wine first and then the poor wine later when everybody's drunk freely. This does not mean intoxicated. I want to point that out. If this doesn't mean we wait until everybody's smashed and then we go get the cheap stuff. No, this just means everybody's had an opportunity to be satisfied with the good wine. It's sort of like a first impressions thing. When somebody comes to your house to visit, you don't bring out the, the bad stuff, you bring out the good stuff. And, and, and then if they stay a long time and they like your company, then we can get out the cheap stuff and that's fine. But this doesn't mean intoxicated. But he says, but you have kept the good wine until now, which means that this wine that he's been served is better than all the wine he's tasted at this event so far. It's the best wine that he's tasted. This is a confirmation that what Jesus created was not water that kind of tastes a little bit like wine. It's water that was converted completely into a fermented beverage that looked and tasted like the best of wines. This was a full-on miracle. Now, one, one of the questions that comes up sometimes when you're studying this is, how much of this water actually got converted to wine? Was it every bit of water in all six jars, or was it only the amount that they drew out and took to the guy? I have a feeling it's all six jars, mm -hmm. because for, for a few reasons. One, if it was only the little bit that he took out and took to the master of the, of the feast, did Jesus really solve the problem? No. I mean, why act like you're solving the problem if you haven't? How long do you think it took them to fill up 180 gallons worth of water? A while. 
like when I used to read this story, I thought they went out and got the hose and brought it over. No, they don't have running water. They've mm -hmm. got to go pump it out of a well, lift it up, carry it in buckets, and pour it into these giant stone jars. That would have taken quite a while. And then only when all six are done, then he tells them to go do this. That would have been a considerable waste of effort. In addition, if there's six full jars, 180 gallons worth of wine, that's the good wine, that's a miracle. And I really believe that that's what, what's going on here. One of the reasons why some commentators will say, well, he only produced this little bitty bit, is they would say, Jesus would not have wanted to create so much wine and encourage drunkenness. Well, I, the, the presence of alcohol doesn't necessarily encourage drunkenness. This was the same commentator that said, surely if Jesus was at the wedding, that must mean that the bride and groom were very holy people. Uh, I don't see that being the case. We don't see Jesus only hanging out with holy people in his ministry. Right. He spends a lot of time with people that the Pharisees considered just straight up sinners. That's the only thing you need to know about them. They're sinners. They're tax collectors. They're prostitutes. They're, they're drunken people. Um, they're, they're all sorts of manner of evil people, and Jesus hung out with them. So I don't really see that that's the case either. So here I would say all six jars were converted to the best of wines. Now let's talk a little bit about who was privy to this miracle. Here it says in verse 11, this, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So if I'm to list out, like, who actually knew that this, this miracle happened? Who would you say knew about it? Mary and the servants and the disciples, at least. Mary, the servants, the disciples, of whom at most there were probably five at this point. I think, Alyssa, you read verse 12. Can you reread mm -hmm. for me verse 12? Yes. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. Good. And this sounds anecdotal. But here, this is the first time that this word brothers is used. In Greek, this is adelphoi, which can be used to mean brothers or brothers and sisters. So here, I'm going to write brothers and sisters. This is the first time we get a hint that his brothers and sisters were even at this wedding, but they were there. They would have been at the table with Mary and Jesus and his disciples and would have seen what happened. But this crowd right here, is this a big crowd? The wedding crowd? Mm -hmm. The wedding crowd could have been large, but the group who were aware of the miracle that he had performed, was that a large crowd? No, no it wasn't. It was a small group of not really important people. We're talking about fishermen, uh, a relatively unknown rabbi named Jesus, Mary, who at this point may have been a widow, which is um, someone who had a lower status at that point, his brothers and sisters that we really don't hear much about except for Jude and James, who go on to become leaders in the New Testament church, but they aren't at this point. This is a very small crowd of not very important people. There were no kings in this list, no other prophets or religious leaders in this list, and yet this was the crowd that he chose to show his first miracle. This kind of makes me think about his birth. At his birth, he was born in Bethlehem, the city of David, a very small town. No room in the inn, so he was born in a barn. He was laid in a feeding trough, and shepherds were the first ones to hear about him. People who were so low on the totem pole that people would not have even believed them when they told them they had seen the Messiah, the, the King of the Jews born that night. That his birth was announced to such a small group and here his first miracle kind of has that same setting. You know, the Jews were looking at that time for a Messiah who would ride out on a white horse and rescue them from the Romans and push them out and and reestablish a, a, a nation of Israel that belonged just to the Jews. And it's so far from that, that his, his very first miraculous act in his ministry is only privy to such a small group of people. 
even in the place where they were, there could have been many, many other people there, but not all of them even knew what had happened. That's amazing to me. I think it has something to do with the reflect, the reflect the nature of, of Jesus and his ministry. He does a lot of one-on-one, -on -one. like mm -hmm. he heals the blind man one-on-one. -on -one. He touches the leper one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, the woman with the issue of blood one-on-one. -on -one. He, and that's his heart. He wants an individual relationship with each one of us. It's a one-on-one. -on -one. It's not a one for all. You know, and he meets us where he needs us. And I think that if he could have done this, quote, miracle with a one-on-one, -on -one, he would have. But in, in, the, in the context of the, the wedding and he wanted to honor his mom, mom's request, it was, it was a little small crowd. But he, he, he's not about pomp and circumstance for, you know, the way we see today getting on a stage and whatnot. It's a very personal ministry, you know, and it's a mm -hmm. reflection of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it also relates to how we see related by the Gospels elsewhere later in his ministry as he's healing people a number of times. He'll heal someone and strictly charge them to tell no one. And mm -hmm. there is, uh, I think there are a few reasons for that, but one of them is like you were talking about earlier, God's timing. And one is that he, to, to fulfill prophecy, to fulfill God's promises, he was taking salvation the offer salvation to the jews first and it was not expanded to the gentiles until later and there's this timing that goes along with that 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 seems uh, counterintuitive or strange to look at we think this is jesus why would he not want to spread this everywhere and, and have news abound but there's that aspect and then there's the aspect of just we see him getting mobbed later on in his ministry where it's difficult to <laughs> do anything or get anywhere because everybody around wants to wants a part of this miracle work and so right right absolutely so here he's done he's performed this first of his signs um john likes to use this word that we that we translate into english most accurately as signs um my dad owns a sign company signs always point to something. They, they inform, they communicate. It's not, uh, it's not just a pretty thing. If it was a pretty thing, uh, we'd call a sign art. But here, when we talk about miracles being signs, they point to something. In the case of miracles that God has given a, a man to do, a normal man to do, signs frequently point to um, being sent or having authority that is granted uh, to them by God to communicate a particular message. In Jesus's case, it says that he manifested his glory, that this was a sign that he was divine, that he was deity, that he was the son of God. Um, and in each case where we see one of these signs, the result is that somebody new believes in him that that's always the result of one of these signs. They believe in him. So here it says in verse 11, um, this is the first of his signs. It manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. We also get a hint that that wasn't the only, that since they were the only ones to witness it, his brothers and sisters have grown up with him. Um, it's probably been pretty hard. Like I'm a, I'm a firstborn and, and, sometimes the firstborn often appears as the good one. That doesn't mean I'm good, but you can appear that way if you're not a firstborn. And, and I can imagine in their family that not only was he the firstborn, he was also the son of God and probably was the good one all the time and that probably drove them nuts. And yet here they actually get to witness he's done a miracle. He... He is more than just the firstborn in our family. All those stories that Mary told us growing up about his birth, that we were like, Mom, that's a weird story. I mean, I believe you because you're my mom, but I've never heard anybody else tell a story like that about Jesus. Goody two-shoes Jesus. And here now he's not just showed up with five guys in tow. He's also performed an obvious miracle. And now his brothers and sisters are beginning to see for the first time he really is the Son of God. 
So this is what I want us to see. When we see miracles and signs in the book of John, we're going to be asking ourselves, what does it show about the person doing the miracle or sign, and what is the result? Here, it shows his glory, and the result is that the disciples believe in him. So next, they're going to go to Capernaum, and then in verse 13, we're going to talk about next week, they end up in Jerusalem, which is several days away, and Jesus is going to make a lot of people mad in the temple. So read ahead uh, for next week. Let's see. Any questions, thoughts? Cool. Well, I'm excited. Um, I'm, I'm excited for chapter two and for what we're going to be getting into. Um, would anybody like to volunteer to close us in prayer before we get back to work? I'll do it. Thank you. Father, we just come before you in the name of your precious son, Jesus, and we just thank you for this privilege of meeting together and just learning more about your word and letting it change us, Lord. And we just thank you um, that you are God Almighty, that you are in control, that you are um, directing us and directing our prayers for our families, um, our company, our nation. Um, just thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. And we give you praise. Help us to continue seeing you in the midst of the darkness that we're in right now and that you give us hope, that you give us hope that um, you are in control and you are um, just keeping our families and, and children safe and even our company. Lord, we just pray for Articulate right now. So we just thank you for this Bible study. God bless Scott and his family and that son of his who has that stomach flu. And um, give us all patience with our children and each other because we are um, being called to a time of simpler things and uh, mm. relearning things, Lord, and, and how to do them. So we just give you praise and we give you thanks and we call you God in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you all for coming.